right. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Words and Pictures 2020. We are so excited to have you here. Um, this is our fourth year doing Words and Pictures, and our uh, event is usually held at the Cascade Park Community Library in East Vancouver. But unfortunately, this year, um, we are not open to the public for programs. However, we decided to take Words and Pictures virtual. So we're so excited that you're able to join us. Uh, my name is Mary. I am the branch manager of the Cascade Park Community Library. And I am joined today by Rebecca Cherbany, who also works at the Cascade Park Library, and Christy Peterson, who is the uh, author who tirelessly, tirelessly works every year to help us identify speakers for this event. So just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our keynote speaker today. I will say that we are recording our presentation today for later viewing. So um, just I uh, just wanted to give everyone a heads up about that. Um, no personal identifying information or for our attendees will be included in the recording and neither will any of the um, uh, chat that occurs. Uh, we will hold all of our questions till the end, but feel free to ask them at any time and uh, and that's, that's all I have for housekeeping. So moving on, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for Words and Pictures 2020. Fonda Lee is an acclaimed science fiction and fantasy author whose novels include the urban epic fantasy Greenbone Saga. Beginning with Jade City and continuing in Jade War and the forthcoming Jade Legacy and the science fiction novels Zero Boxer, Exo and Crossfire. She is the winner of the World Fantasy Award, a three-time winner of the Aurora Award, Canada's National Science Fiction and Fantasy Award, and a multiple finalist for the Nebula Award, the Locus Award, and the Oregon Book Award. Her novels have garnered multiple star reviews, won awards from the American Library Association, the Junior Library Guild, and Oregon Council of Theater of Teachers of English been included on numerous state reading lists and appeared on best of the year lists from NPR, Barnes and Noble, Sci-Fi Wire, and others. The Greenbone Saga is in development as a television show on Peacock. In addition, Fauna has written acclaimed short fiction and comic books for Marvel. She is a frequent speaker and instructor at writing workshops, including Willamette Writers, Viable Paradise, and Clarion West. Fonda wrote her first novel about a young dragon and assorted companions on a quest for a magic pendant in fifth grade during the long bus ride to and from school each day. Many years later, she cast her high school classmates as characters in her second novel, a pulpy superhero saga co-written with a friend by passing a graphing calculator back and forth during biology class. Fortunately, fortunately both of those experiments are lost to the world forever. <laughs> Following a 10-year career in corporate strategy and finance, Fonda returned to her first love of writing stories about make-believe worlds. She is a black belt martial artist, action movie aficionado, and eggs benedict enthusiast. Born and raised in Canada, she currently resides in Portland, Oregon. It is my pleasure to introduce Fonda Lee, who will be sharing today her thoughts on how the power of creating and consuming stories gets us through difficult times. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Mary. Good afternoon, everyone. I was recently part of an online question and answer event with a number of fellow science fiction and fantasy authors. And a member of the audience asked us this question. I'm an aspiring writer, but I've been paralyzed by unproductivity since COVID began. How do you keep producing art right now? And coming from a group of professional authors, these were the replies. You're not alone. I couldn't write anything for months. I've struggled to be productive as well. And this is my full time job. It's okay to be kind to yourself right now. Write when you can. Give your per yourself permission to take breaks. Find a routine or ritual. Set small and attainable goals. Replenish your creative soul with art, books, TV, movies, music, which by the way, um, I think applies to much more than just the act of writing right now. Over and over again, the responses to this aspiring writer's question acknowledge that it is hard to engage with creative work or even creative play when the real world is overwhelming and there are so many immediate and existential worries. Art, after all, is self-actualizing, and self-actualization is at the very top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
Right? We have to meet our physical needs, our safety needs, our need for esteem and belonging before we can seek that self-actualization. And with so many of us feeling unsafe, anxious, and uncertain, how can we create and engage with literature right now? And yet, the responses to that aspiring writer's question were also unequivocal. Even when it's difficult, you can do it, and it is worth doing. No one told that writer to give up their creative impulses and worry about other things. During the early part of the pandemic, I remember seeing a whole lot of tongue-in-cheek social media posts that taunted writers with the reminder that Shakespeare wrote King Lear while quarantined during the bubonic plague. The response to that, of course, being that Shakespeare was not shut in with small children managing the remote learning over Zoom during the bubonic plague. Of course, it should go without saying that no one should feel guilty for finding it difficult to be creative, much less write the next King Lear uh, during this seemingly apocalyptic year of 2020. However, there is a truth here that I want to highlight. Even in the most dire times, the human urge to tell and consume stories is irrepressible. In her book, Never Say You Can't Survive, how to Get Through Tough Times by Making Up Stories, author Charlie Jane Anders puts it succinctly. Writing can be an act of survival. It gives us heart and purpose and clarity and the ability to keep going. The urge to write stories and share them is instinctive because stories have always been an indispensable community tool that we you humans have used to survive ever since we've been around. Many millennia ago, someone returned to the campfire with the story of the bear attack that they survived and to warn others not to go back to that cave on the other side of the forest. Someone else told a story about the friend who ate a handful of red berries and sadly is not with us anymore. Stories passed down to a community, the knowledge of who their friends and foes were, it told them where to seek good living and how to avoid harm. It recounted dangers of the past and warnings about the future. Stories have always been the essential means to survival, not the resulting luxury of it. So I want to talk about the six reasons that stories are going to help us get through this time together. One, stories connect and comfort us. Over the past six months, one of the silver linings for me personally has been more uninterrupted time to read the books that I've been meaning to get to and to revisit books that I have loved in the past. I've personally received more messages and emails from readers discovering my books now than they did when they were published two or three years ago. And even more gratifyingly, I've watched my children who are unable to go to school, who are missing their friends, take to reading in a way that they hadn't before. Even with libraries and bookstores physically closed, many of us have been turning to books and rediscovering the joy of reading. Storytelling connects us deeply without the need for Zoom or Twitter. It requires the active participation of both the storyteller and the story receiver. Stephen King was right to call it a kind of telepathy because the reader of the book brings to that reading experience their own beliefs and perspectives, their emotions, their state of mind, and it is a meeting of the minds of strangers connecting us even when we are physically separated. Authors work alone in our homes most of the time, and readers may be reading our work by themselves far away, but we are both partners in the act of creating the fictive dream. And I think one of the reasons why people have become so energized and warmed by online cast reunions of Lord of the Rings or The Princess Bride is that we're seeking nostalgia. We're remembering what makes us happy. Reading that favorite novel, maybe the one that you've loved ever since you were a kid, um, is relishing that sense of security of familiar characters, an ending that is known and 
guaranteed. It can feel like spending time with an old friend. And discovering a new favorite book can be like making a friend that you can always come back to. Reason number two, stories are the escape hatch. There's often a bit of a dismissive air to labeling certain types of stories as escapism. The implication being that escapism is frivolous and unimportant, a simple pleasure for the very young or those without better things to do with their time. Writers of speculative fiction in particular, fantasy, science fiction, horror, like myself, are more often than not on the receiving end of being looked down upon as purveyors of escapism. However, at a time when most of us are trapped in our homes, behind our screens, away from our jobs and classmates and friends and family, lured by the self-destructive siren song of doom scrolling through social media for the latest ever more disheartening piece of news, Providing escapism is, I believe, downright heroic. Just like that despairing, unproductive, aspiring author that I mentioned earlier, I have struggled to maintain my creative will during these past months. It's unusually difficult to stay focused. And it's especially easy to feel as if writing fantasy stories about made up worlds doesn't really matter. Surely not when here in the real world, people are losing their lives in a pandemic, injustice and brutality are on daily display, and the future of our democracy is so uncertain. Sometimes the act of writing feels about as futile as trying to chisel through a concrete wall with a plastic spoon. But every once in a while, a plot point that I have been struggling with will fall into place or a character that I've been trying to understand will finally just come to life on the page, or the right words will form themselves into a truly elegant sentence. And when I'm able to sink into the story world completely, even if it's for a short time, everything else ceases to exist. And for that precious amount of time, I'm not worried about anything else because I have exited this timeline. I've gone on spiritual vacation. And when I experience that feeling of immersion, of not just suspend, suspending disbelief, but falling completely into the illusion, it's like magic. And I emerge from it with the renewed belief that the hard work of capturing that feeling, of committing it to paper, of giving it to someone else, is work that is truly worthwhile. Three. Stories help us navigate reality. The truth, of course, is that consuming escapist fiction is not escapism at all. Lately, I have become a huge fan of Korean zombie movies. I watched all the episodes of the excellent series Kingdom on Netflix. Uh, it's a Korean period drama filled with political intrigue amid this mysterious zombie plague that is sweeping the countryside. And then I watched Train to Busan, which is this modern day action thriller, uh, which turned out to be surprisingly heartbreaking, um, but also featured very fast, very scary zombies. Oh, I forgot to mention in between those two, I watched Chernobyl about a deadly crisis horribly mismanaged by a corrupt authoritarian government. Actively seeking out and enjoying stories about disaster and plague may seem to be counterintuitively masochistic, but I know I'm far from the only one with this instinct. The Netflix original movie Pandemic became one of the most watched TV shows in the US this year. The show Contagion didn't really make much of a splash when it first aired on CW in 2019, but has suddenly become a success. A quick Google search turns up lists like 20 best pandemic books for your quarantine, 15 best apocalyptic novels for your quarantine reading list, and so on. As an aside, by the way, a fellow science fiction author, Mike Chen, uh, whose novel uh, Beginning at the End takes place in a post-apocalyptic future after the world is ravaged by an influenza-like virus, um, happens to have his book come out in March 
and he received an irate email from a reader accusing him of exploiting the COVID pandemic to make a buck, which was hilarious to all of his writer friends because uh, it supposes he somehow managed to write and traditionally publish a novel in two weeks. Ah, oh, we can only dream. Well, I was watching um, my Korean zombies on the television screen. I was constantly jolted by the realization that these were true stories. And I don't mean true in the literal sense of the dead rising from the grave to eat the flesh of the living, but true because of their authentic depictions of crisis, power, corruption, heroism, and human nature. I was furious at the court officials in Kingdom who kept the zombie plague a secret in order to preserve their political power at the expense of innocent lives. I cheered the determination of the nurse who was trying to find a cure, of the father who was trying to protect his child, and um, I was heartbroken by the train conductor in Train to Busan who was eaten by zombies while just trying to do his job, and meanwhile this selfish corporate executive pushed others into the path of zombies in order to save himself. What the zombie stories told me over and over again as I watched hordes of snarling undead tear people limb to limb in gruesome and entertaining ways was that they understood what I was going through, what we were going through. We are not being chased by zombies, at least not yet, but we have had our lives upended and there are things to be scared about and angry about in, on a level we haven't prepared for and expected. And so we turn to fiction because whatever we are dealing with has already been imagined by storytellers. Science fiction in particular has always been a genre that has used imagination and speculation about the future to hold up a mirror to current issues. I grew up watching a lot of Star Trek, uh, especially TNG and DS9, and even as starships and holodecks and Cleons entertained me week after week, they also challenged my teenage brain to engage with weighty social issues like colonialism and warfare and racial inequality. I said earlier that creating escapism with fiction is magic, but perhaps it's more accurate to say that it is skillful sleight of hand. Good speculative fiction can and always has forced us to confront the real world by taking us out of the specifics of our own situation and placing us on a starship or a colony planet or a fantasy world. It recontextualizes the big issues in ways that make them both clearer and more confrontable. Lisa Crone, the author of Wired for Story, has written and spoken at length about how our brains are designed to process narrative in order to make sense of the world. In her words, we don't turn to story to escape reality, but to navigate reality. Reason number four, books imagine the light beyond the darkness. Lately, I've been hearing a lot of rueful, half-joking resignation among my fellow science fiction writers that the bar for writing dystopian fiction just keeps being raised because the stuff in fiction keeps coming true. In a way, it's a tacit acknowledgement that part of our job as storytellers is to stay ahead of reality, to use our imagination as a flashlight scouting ahead into the wilderness of emotional and social uncertainty of community and individual struggle. Storytelling is fundamentally hopeful human behavior. Rarely is there no hope in stories. If we can imagine the monster in the woods, we can also imagine the scenario by which we survive that monster. If all the hardships that we are going through now and we will or ever could go through have already been written about, then the other side of those hardships has also been written about as well. We can generally count on even the bleakest fictional depictions of the future, 1984, The Handmaid's Tale, 
the Hunger Games, Fahrenheit 451, Mad Max, we can count on them to contain at least in their core some hopeful light. Because the protagonists always fight. It would be a very brief, very boring story if Katniss lay down on the ground and waited to die in the Hunger Games. If the handmaids did not try to escape their oppressive servitude. If the firemen did not hide the books from the flames. But they always fight. That is the nature of protagonists and is why we read about them. And sometimes they do bring down the empire, the system, the villain, and sometimes they don't. But even when they don't, they achieve something heroic in the very act of hope and endurance, even if that is merely to warn us, the readers on the other side of the fourth wall. There is an unspoken time-honored pact between the writer and the reader. The writer says, take my hand and I will lead you around the bend into the dark forest. And the reader agrees saying, I will go with you. I want to see what you have to show me and I trust you to lead me out again. Reason number five, stories create empathy. Take any get together of friends, even if it's over Zoom these days. And at some point, someone is going to start telling a story. So the other day, this thing happened to me. What are our responses to these ubiquitous everyday storytelling moments? It could be, that's great. I'm really happy for you. Or, oh man, that, that's terrible. Is there anything I can do to help? Or, oh yeah, that happened to me too. Let me tell you about it. On the whole, our natural response to hearing stories, especially from those we care about, is empathy. We're hardwired to respond to stories with empathy because they're the means by which we connect with other people. What writers do is we trick you into caring about fictional people the same way that you care about real ones, maybe even more so. One of my favorite things as an author is receiving messages from readers telling me that they were so stressed out by what my characters were going through that they felt physically ill. Now, I know that it is rather sadistic of me to enjoy that, but it is so gratifying because it means that I succeeded in making readers understand and feel strongly about these made up people. There's been brain research done that shows that when we read about an experience, the parts of our brains associated with that activity light up as if we were actually having that experience in real life. Reading is basically virtual reality. It is the OG virtual reality. And what this means is that stories are the most powerful tool that we have to bridge divides between people. There's this old saying, don't judge someone until you've walked in their shoes. Well, writers are the masters of putting you in others' shoes. We're capable of telling stories that make people feel empathy for an extraterrestrial being or a horse or someone who lived in ancient Rome. Right now, it seems that everything, racial inequality, the wealth gap, politics, red states and blue states is unrelentingly pushing people apart. And I believe that one of the most powerful tools we have to combat the forces of division is reading and specifically reading with an open mind and a desire to understand the experiences and perspectives of other people, especially those whose voices have historically been underrepresented or ignored. Last year, when I read Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, I felt as if that one book did more to open my eyes to the lived reality of the African-American experience with police brutality than anything that I had been taught in high school or post-secondary education. I gave it to my teenage daughter to read so she could better understand the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a good reason that book has spent 185 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. 
And it's only one example of the many books that are out there that I wish I could force into the hands of every elected official. According to recent statistics though, one in four Americans don't read books at all in any format. I believe that a society that does not read will become a fundamentally less curious and empathetic one. And conversely, that one of the best things that we can be doing with our time right now, while staying home responsibly, instead of going out to bars, is reading. To bulk up those muscles of understanding and empathy that we are so desperately going to need if we hope to change our society for the better. Six, the power of stories belongs to everyone. I've wanted to be a writer since I was 10 years old. I was a voracious reader and my teachers noticed how much I wrote. So when I was in sixth grade, one of them nominated me for a mentorship program for gifted kids. For one semester, I was paired up with a published short story writer whose name I unfortunately can no longer remember. What I do remember is that when I shyly showed this intimidating grown up my very first fantasy novel, the one I wrote on the bus on a big lined stack of paper bound together with elastics, she did not, like all of my teachers, simply praise me for how creative I was. Instead, she asked me, why are all the characters boys? I was taken aback. My story was about a team of six characters on a magical quest, and it had never occurred to me to question why I had automatically made all of them male. The answer now, of course, is blindingly obvious. Nearly all of the science fiction and fantasy that I read as a child were about boys and young men, specifically, white young men of vaguely Northern European stock, going on epic, dangerous adventures. So as a 12-year-old writer who was really rather proud of herself for writing a proper fantasy novel, I was kind of defensive. I mean, what did this lady know anyway? She wrote realistic short stories, not the novels that I wanted to write. I mean, I had read The Hobbit and the Tripod Trilogy and the Prydain Chronicles, so I knew that all the heroes in those stories were boys. And uh, white male heroes were in fact a prerequisite for writing a proper fantasy story in the first place. I did grudgingly at more at my mentor's prompting add a female character to my manuscript. Um, but over the next several years, that childhood dream that I had of becoming an author became buried under a heavy blanket of pragmatism. Whether she intended to do this or not, that childhood writing mentor had forced me to confront the massive gap between me as a person and the types of stories that I loved. The only Asian American author that I'd ever heard of was Amy Tan, and I had only heard of her because my mom had bought a copy of her book, The Joy Luck Club. But the sorts of immigrant Chinese stories that Amy Tan wrote were nothing like the stories that I related to and wanted to write. For 20 years after my first attempt at a novel, I, I continued writing for myself as a hobby, but I accepted the idea that writing and writing science fiction and fantasy in particular was, I guess, not for me after all. The renowned Nigerian author, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, has a fantastic TED talk that you should all go search up on the internet and listen to if you haven't done so already in which she talks about the danger of the single story. In her words, power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. In my youth, I internalized the idea that the fantasy genre I loved was comprised of a type of story centered around people different from me. I'd internalized that the Asian American story was a certain type of story because I only knew of one example. These days, the landscape of available stories and storytellers is far different. The most meaningful emails and messages that I receive come from aspiring writers 
who tell me that they saw themselves in my books or that my work changed their idea of what the fantasy genre could be or that it motivated them to write their own stories. There are still barriers in the publishing industry and there is still need for more voices and stories to combat the flattening effect of the single story that Adiche spoke of. But I could easily name half a dozen fantasy authors whose voices would have had a formative effect on me if I had been exposed to them when I was young. It's why I believe that even as we struggle with difficult problems, there is a greater degree of recognition that the stories behind those problems need to be told honestly from many voices rather than the single dominant viewpoint. It's easier than ever for people to tell their stories and get them out there. Even if it's something as simple and fleeting as a post on, on Facebook or a 10 second video, stories have power and that power is within the grasp of more people than it ever has been before. So there you have it. My six reasons for why, despite everything, being a writer today, working with words and surrounded by books gives me reason for optimism. I thought at the beginning of this pandemic that I would use my quarantine time to catch up on my towering stack of unread novels and the enormous list of television shows I'd been needing to get to. And yet after six months, I have only made a slightly larger than average dent in my list because more stuff keeps coming out. Sometimes it makes me want to cry because I know I will never get to all the stories that I want to consume, even if I lived a dozen lifetimes. But these days I see my increasingly unconquerable TBR pile as a sign of the undeniable resilience of the human spirit. We are collectively writing and telling stories all the time, under any and all circumstances, as long as we are alive and breathing we will tell stories. There is, unfortunately, a downside to the wealth of available fiction, which is that books have become grossly devalued. Because there is a robust supply of books now easily delivered within seconds by digital means, many people have come to believe, some rather vociferously, that creative work should be cheap or free. And it's easy to overlook or ignore the fact that the ecosystem that delivers stories to readers is endangered. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced independent bookstores across the country to close their doors, shuttering many vital hubs in local reading communities. Many of them are struggling to survive on already thin margins. Meanwhile, Amazon has doubled its net profit during the pandemic year to $5.2 billion. It now accounts for half of all print book sales and three quarters of all ebook sales. The legendary and outspoken science fiction luminary, the late Ursula Le Guin, had this to say about the current book selling marketplace under Amazon dominance. Sell it fast, sell it cheap, dump it, sell the next thing. I promise this is not about to become a rant against Amazon, which I recognize is the only way for a lot of people to shop these days. But the truth is that ever since its inception, Amazon's strategy has been to deeply discount books as a loss leading product. Books are already, I believe, the best value for money and entertainment that you can buy when you consider how many hours of enjoyment you get out of a book compared to say, a trip to the Cineplex, but people have been trained to believe that books should be $1.99 or 99 cents or free. I had an argument with my brother-in-law not that long ago in which he told me that my profession was doomed because to quote, no one pays for books. He argued that it was easier to download an illegal copy of a book than to sign up for a library card. After all, the long wait times for some of the popular new books at your local library exist because libraries acquire those books legally and there is a limited supply of them. It's easier in the minds of many to simply bypass that way illegally. Controversy erupted earlier this year when the Internet Archive 
launched a service called the National Emergency Library, allowing unlimited downloads of books under copyright that they had not licensed from publishers. When the Authors Guild, the American Association of Publishers and prominent authors denounced the practice as being unlawful and harmful to the income of writers and publishers at a time that they needed it, they were met with often vitriolic backlash, sometimes by people who argued that authors should be grateful to be published at all, no matter their own need to pay bills and afford health care. One thing that became clear to me in the whole kerfuffle is that there is a disheartening number of people who don't comprehend the difference between their public library, which plays a vital role in promoting and supporting authors, and internet piracy, in which no one in the supply chain of literature, the author, the publisher, or the bookseller sees a cent. Because storytelling and art are such an irresistible drive and so important to our individual and collective well-being, we so often take the access to them for granted, at least until the economic model doesn't work anymore. Right now, I am personally desperately missing my usual routine of settling down at a quiet table in my local library to get some writing done. When libraries shut their doors during the pandemic, we lost community hubs where people went not just to get books, but to work, to study, and to just take refuge in a place without expectation that they buy something. Even with their physical doors closed, libraries are still serving their communities as best they can with ebook borrowing, curbside pickups and drop offs, and digital programming like this very festival today. And it forces me to wonder if public libraries did not already exist, would there be the political and public will in our country today to create them? And I'm forced to conclude that sadly it would be unlikely. Think for a minute about what libraries are, a nationwide network of taxpayer funded institutions that exist for the purpose of providing a readily purchasable product, books, for free to everyone who wants them, regardless of income or any other factor, on the sole condition that those people return the books so they can be loaned out again to others who want to read them. Libraries exist because of the very simple idea that books and the stories and knowledge they contain are vital to society and that everyone should have easy access to them. All while still financially supporting the authors and publishers that make the books pub possible. If the idea of libraries was being proposed today, I can easily imagine how it would be denounced as being costly, unnecessary, a sign of a overreaching government telling us how to spend our time and interfering with the free market. Probably, in fact, part of some radical un-American socialist agenda. How much more intellectually and creatively impoverished are we becoming in a world where libraries could not exist if they didn't already? I hope that one of the small silver linings of 2020 is the chance for many of us to step back, reset our priorities, and appreciate some of the things that we might have taken for granted, but that are now so important in getting us through this time. Time with our family, maintaining connection to friends, being outdoors and in nature, personal hobbies, the creative value of being bored, and yes, curling up in a comfy chair with a good book. I want to end by saying a few things to those of you who are part of the story making industry. To the writers who are watching this, as well as the artists, filmmakers, other creatives, remember that your work has value and meaning. It is not frivolous. It is not fiddling while the Titanic sinks. If you write incisive, unflinching fiction that lays bare and examines the worst impulses of humanity, your work has value. If you write fluffy, feel-good stories with goofy adventures and happy endings, your work has value. If you make people angry about unfairness, if you make them weep with sympathy, if you make them laugh in triumph, your work has value. 
If you are compelled to tell stories, it is a calling to be proud of. To the librarians and booksellers, you may not be officially classified as essential workers, but the work that you do is essential because you operate the superstores of ideas. We've seen you pivoting madly to take online orders or run curbside pickups and do digital programming, making sure that the literary hubs of our communities remain vital and accessible to everyone who needs them right now. Writers like me can commit words to paper, but you're the ones who put stories in the hands of people who need them. To readers, keep the ecosystem of storytelling healthy. Just as if you'd want to manage a forest that you hope your children will enjoy. Support your independent bookstores and your local libraries. When you buy books online, try bookshop.org and Libro FM. A portion of their profits go directly to independent bookstores. Borrow ebooks from your library instead of downloading pirated copies. And tell others to do the same. If your library doesn't have a book that you want, ask them to buy it. I have requested books many times and have almost always gotten them, along with the satisfaction that I have made a sale for that author. Above all, take advantage of the wealth of stories around us. Read widely. Read stories by and about those who are different from you. Read about different cultures, people, and experiences, and encourage others to do the same. Fight the danger of the single story. Seek out the stories that delight you, that examine the world, and that build empathy. It's said that experience is the source of wisdom. A famous living fantasy author, George R. R. Martin, said, a reader lives a thousand lives. The man who never reads lives only one. Wisdom captured and passed along in stories, from writer to reader, from friend to friend, from stranger to stranger, and from generation to generation, is what will get us not just through this year or this pandemic, but all the challenges we must collectively face so that at some point in a better future, they will tell stories about us. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the festival and rest of the weekend. Stay safe, read, and vote. Wow. Thank you so much, Fonda. That was an incredible, incredible talk. Um, a little emotional. Thank you. Um, uh, I uh, haven't seen any questions come in, but I'm hoping that um, folks will um, share any questions that they may have uh, in the chat or in the Q&A, whichever um, works best for them. Um, I do have a couple of questions here for you, um, if, if you can. Um, so uh, I'm just curious to know, since you spoke about writing um, during a pandemic and, and some of the difficulties that people have, um, have had, I'm curious to know if your writing process has changed with the way that, um, I mean, you said you used to write in the library, so obviously location perhaps, but I'm curious if anything else about your process has changed. Yeah, I have found it um, more difficult to draft new words. So fortunately, for, for the beginning part of the pandemic, I was working on revision, which um, was not too bad because I felt like I had something to work with. Um, but one of the struggles um, that I have, I have found is that it's hard to step out of our own reality for long enough to, um, to really dive into drafting fresh work and fresh ideas and, and worlds. Um, there's always that like distraction factor of, oh, what's on the news now? Or like, oh, what's happened this time? That's constantly pulling me away. Um, so I really have had to be very disciplined about um, two things. The first, um, carving out that time and um, being vigilant about staying off the internet for certain periods of time. So this year I started habit tracking myself and giving myself like a, a certain amount of time to be on the internet and then um, not letting myself be on it for a, enough time to get some work done. And then honestly being um, understanding of myself and realizing like I'm not as productive as I used to be. Um, and you know, maybe I'm not gonna get as many words down on the page as I would if I had my whole usual routine. Um, for me in particular, my whole family's at home. 
my, my husband is working from home, my kids are remote schooled um, on Zoom and they're, they've, they're yelling for something or they've got tech issues or, um, and so we're, we've all kind of carved out our own little cubbies in the house and my home is normally my office. So it's as if a number of other people just moved into my office and <laughs> I've got to put up with it. So I, I think we're all just trying to, to make do and to figure out how best to still like that, like the um, writer who posed the question in the Q&A, um, how do you do it? You've, you've just got to, uh, to, to do the best you can and carve out the pieces and keep going. Excellent. I'm sure that's very helpful for some of our aspiring, aspiring writers uh, in our crowd today. Um, we did receive a question about the recording. I'll just uh, mention that we will be posting this recording um, as soon as possible. So stay tuned uh, to our YouTube channel. Um, thank you to Fonda for allowing us to record today. I, I, I imagine a lot of people need to hear this and I'm, I'm really glad that we'll have an opportunity to share it with those who are unable to join us today. Uh, we did receive a question um, from a member of the audience. When you are feeling stuck with a character or plot point, what do you find helps you get unstuck? Well, this is interesting because I feel like I have been here many times. I'm, I've now written uh, six published books and I'm working on my seventh. And I've been stuck plenty of times. And it, to me, seems like every point at which I get unstuck was due to some some trying something else so i never feel as if there's like a a magic tool that works every time so as as a writer um i think part of learning to to move forward is having a toolbox of things that you can try and they don't always consistently work and i've done things like put the book aside for a period of time and work on something else and reset and then sometimes that helps me to step away. So when I come back to the work, I'm looking at it with fresh eyes. Um, at other times I have um, re-outlined the book. So I've basically printed off the entire manuscript, started reading at the beginning, figured out where it started to go off the rails or where it hit a wall. And then I will re-outline from there. Um, that's another tool. I have taken lots of long walks. Um, I have stared out of the window. <laughs> I have um, done things like re I've outlined backwards where I know how it's going to end, but I'm stuck in a certain place. So I will um, start with where I know it ends and then what's the second last scene and the third to last scene and the fourth to last scene until I kind of eat away um, to the point where I'm stuck. So there's, um, I could go on for a while because it, it does feel like every time you're stuck, it may be for a different reason. It may be because you're not clear on what the character's motivation is, or um, there's some logic issue with your plot that you're just, un it's not working out, or maybe the point of view isn't right. So um, each time you're stuck, um, it may be for a a different reason than the time you were stuck before. So the best thing to do is to try a number of things. Um, you know, writers fall into different camps as to whether they believe writer's block is real or not. Um, because writer's block is, uh, writer's block's a symptom rather than like a disease. So um, it's a symptom of something not being right with the manuscript or perhaps with you as the writer, you know, either you're not in the right headspace to work on that thing right now or um, you know, it, it, there's there's something else going on with your motivation, or um, you know, you just don't love that project right now. So um, so I know that's going to be you know that 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 kind of feels like I threw a bunch of stuff at the wall, um, but that's actually literally what I do when I'm stuck. That that makes perfect sense. Um, let's see. I have uh, one question here. Um, have you always been wanted to be a writer? And if not, when did you know that? I mean, you spent 20 years in a in a completely different field, probably using a completely different side of your brain. Um, when did you know that there were these stories inside you that just had to get out? Well, um, I have, like I mentioned, wanted to be a writer since I was very young, um, and it ended up being for a while like a pipe dream that I had. One of those things that, you know, you sort of go, ah, oh, I want to try writing, I want to run a marathon one day, or like, I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, right? Like, it's one of those things that you, you, it sounds good, and like, you would really want to do it, but you don't kind of really know how to go about that, um, and you're not really taking yourself super seriously. Uh, for me, what happened was I hit a point in my career where I wasn't able to write anymore because I was so busy 
with my day job and with my family that um, my favorite hobby, which was writing, just fell by the wayside. And that's when I sort of had this epiphany that like, this is a dream that I've always had and I've always done it and, and I let it slip. And I had a, a crisis, I guess, if you will, where I was like, oh, I want to be a published author. I know that's something I, I've always wanted and I'm sure not you know, making progress to it or getting any younger. So, um, so, so I think for me, it was um, just allowing myself to not be pragmatic about it and, and to kind of jump out of the airplane and, and commit myself to it. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that that is a very common thing you'll, you'll hear a lot of, right? The wonderful thing about being a writer is that um, there's not an expiry date on it, right? Like you, you, you amass all this life experience and that actually helps you be a writer um, even well into your, into your life. All right, uh, just one more question and we'll, we'll wrap it up. But um, just curious, I know your next novel is coming out. When can we expect it? And uh, so people can start putting in their pre-orders and uh, getting ready for it to hit the shelves. So um, my next novel will be Jade Legacy, which is the third and final novel in the Greenbone Saga trilogy. And the first two books are Jade City and Jade War, um, which are both out. And um, Jade Legacy will be out in September of 2021, which I know sounds like I can't even imagine that right now. That sounds so so far away. Um, but uh, but hopefully by then, you know, we'll be in a state where I can go out and do events and and so on. Um, but it is turned in. So for those of you who are like, I will refuse to start a fantasy series until I'm guaranteed that it will be done. It is turned into my publisher. It will come out. Um, and then after that, I've got a number of other projects on my plate. Wonderful. Yes, I've, I've started to call it the George R.R. R. Martin syndrome, right? You just don't want to get invested. Um, all right. Um, it looks like we did get one last question from the audience. I want to make sure we get this answered. Um, someone asked, um, what gave you inspiration to write your story? Did you get support from your family as a full-time writer? And historically, there have been very few Asian Americans who write science fiction. Do you see that changing? Um, well, I'll, I guess I'll try and hit those in order. Um, so in terms of like inspiration and support, like it, it has been um, absolutely crucial that I've had the support from my family. I think almost every writer who is able to do this long term has a support system in place, um, whether that be their spouse, uh, you know, their family members um, and fellow writer friends who will keep them accountable, who will cheerlead for them. So um, for me, I, I was very fortunate that um, I had, the, I, you know, told my family, like, I know I had, I know I got a, an MBA and I had this business career, but now I want to write fantasy stories. So, um, you know, I think, I think they were a little bit like, oh, okay. But they, I, I was very lucky that they were supportive. Um, and in terms of Asian Americans writing science fiction, I think that has changed considerably. I, I mean, I can name easily a dozen Asian American writers of science fiction and fantasy um, because uh, exactly what I said in my speech, um, you know, we've, we didn't see what we wanted to read growing up um, and it felt like a much more um, closed viewpoint um, with that, with the, within the genre. Um, and now I think, you know, there's just also just the fact that we're getting translated science fiction from Asia. Um, we're having Asian Americans who write science, science fiction. You have um, more, uh, works that are like just much more diverse in their viewpoints and, and the broadening of the genre as a whole has been fantastic to see. All right, well, thank you very much, Fonda, for being here. Thank you for all of our attendees for joining us today um, for uh, Words and Pictures Festival 2020. I also wanna thank my um, uh, colleagues here, uh, Rebecca Cherveny and Christy Peterson for being with us today um, and all of uh, everyone who's helped so far. Um, thank you, Fonda. I will say we are going to be ending this webinar. If you check back to your PDF, you'll see um, our next uh, session at five o'clock
o'clock is our author illustrator happy hour and i hope you will join us many of our um, local public or local authors will be there um, for you to get a chance to uh, spend some time with so um, please join us there thank you everyone for coming thank you fonda and i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your saturday thank you mary bye thank you everyone